Okay, so in this lecture, or in this portion of the lecture, this video, we're going to be looking at best first search. And this is going to be the last video on uninformed search. So we're going to look at the general idea of best first search, and then we're going to look at the first instance of that, which is Dijkstra's algorithm. And we're going to do a complete proof of the complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm and the properties that we have with it. And, well, I'm mostly complete. There's some details we won't get into um, beyond our abstract models of the problem. And what we're going to see here is that, um, uh, well, in fact, if you were to go look, so if you're looking at the course or you go back and we, we have uh, Dijkstra, the paper from Dijkstra's algorithm available, or you can go and try and find that. If you look at that paper, the paper is quite short and there's no real proofs there of the correctness of that algorithm. And that may seem that it's somewhat obvious, but here we're going to go through all the details and we're going to make sure they get them, we get them all correct. So let's go ahead and get started. So the topic we're moving into, and in which uh, most, much of what we're going to look at in the class, um, but not everything, is this topic of best first search. Okay, and so best first search is a really broad class of algorithms, with the general idea being that we're going to have some notion of best, we're going to be greedy with respect to best, and we're going to choose to expand states in the order of best. So often, so this is expand um, in the order of best, which is often written as a function f, f of an n. And um, best for searches have a couple things that we need to define or have as properties here, and we'll discuss this a little bit. Okay, so we have an open list. Now this isn't necessarily a list, but um, this is states that have been generated, but not expanded. And of course, I haven't defined formally what it means to be generated or expanded yet, but we'll get there. Um, we're going to have a closed list, which is all states that have been expanded. Now, I'm going to say something here. Uh, we are going to get to algorithms in a little bit that are able to take states, expand them, and then take them off the closed list, put them back onto the open, and then re-expand them, which might seem to violate this definition. But for uh, the next couple of weeks, when we're looking at these algorithms, we're actually going to stick with algorithms that do not re-expand states. And so, um, so we'll keep this definition for right now. Okay, so now we need to define two things. We need to define what it means to generate a state and to expand a state. And to uh, generate a state means that we are going to take a, um, a neighbor of that state and call the successor function. And the successor function is going to generate this state. Um, so this is the state is returned from the um, successor of S, where S is a parent of the state that we're thinking about being generated. So in other words, uh, we call the successor function, and then this state was generated by the successor function. So we're calling what the successor function is, is to generate a state. And typically generated states are then going on to the open list. And then the other operation we're going to have is to expand states. And expanding a state is to uh, take a state from open and to uh, generate successors and then to put on closed. Again, there are algorithms and I we don't have time in this class to go over many of these algorithms, but there are algorithms that again would maybe expand in a slightly different way. There's an algorithm called partial expansion A star. So when it wants to expand a state, it's going to do only partially. It's going to take the state from open, generate some of the successors, and then put the state back onto open and not put it on closed. But again, we're not going to talk about those right now, and we're thinking more generally uh, about 
best for search in sort of the most common place that you'll see. But as we get into sort of, you know, more advanced algorithms, then these are the types of things we start uh, to do or we start seeing that algorithms do this to improve performance. Okay, now just to say a little bit about the data structures there. Um, so we have an open list and a closed list. And in practice, these aren't lists, okay? And in pr practice, they're gonna be some sort of priority queue and often a hash table plus a priority queue put together. Um, these can be implemented with buckets if we know that we um, have some properties on our F cost, uh, buckets where we bucket states that all have the same cost. And, um, and then, you know, there's quite complicated data structures you can use depending like, on the algorithm and the efficiency that you need, and also depending on the properties of the state space. So given all of those things, um, the first thing I would just say is if you're going to be implementing these, and if you're taking this class from me, you're going to have to implement um, some of these things, uh, maybe not exactly this. It uh, depends on, on how you're doing things or what you're gonna choose to do as your project. But um, the general thing that you should do is not start with the complex data structures. So much of the complexity of A star is actually in getting an efficient implementation, efficient data structures. And so it's much better actually to write the algorithm to get everything working. So you could actually write it with lists. You could do all the operations that you need to do uh, in a very linear and very expensive way. And then once you know that everything's working, you've got efficient, you know, not worrying about the efficiency of the data structure, but working about, worrying about the correctness, then you can go and say, now, nah, how do I make this more efficient? And the key point here is that um, when I, you know, you give you a program and I say, well, let's say, write me a program that can generate paths. And if you have a choice between being fast and correct, um, I'd much rather that you're correct. If you're gonna be incorrect or sort of not recurrent correct solutions, then I might as well just have a program that run, you know, says return zero. And uh, that's gonna be blazingly fast and not correct. So um, correctness is sort of the first thing we need to strive for. Once we have correctness, then we can think about efficiency and doing these things better. Okay, so what does a best first search look like as a generic best first search? And um, this is something that sometimes is called best first search with no re-expansions. And we'll come back to that when we get into suboptimal search. Oops. Okay, so best first search. We're gonna think of this into two pieces because um, there's a very simple pseudocode for best first search, and then we'll talk about the expansion uh, phase of best first search. So um, the first thing that you're gonna do, so we're gonna be passing generally, and I'm not gonna talk about the details in the pseudocode, but you might be passing an environment. You generally have a state, uh, you have some representation of what actions are. And uh, depending on how you implement things in your, in your exact domain, there's, a, there's some choices that you have here. And so I don't wanna get into those details, but I'm going to have a start state. And so what I'm gonna do is, the first thing is I'm gonna put the start on the open lists. Okay. So that's my data structure, whatever it is. And then we generally have a while loop uh, while the open is not empty. And we're gonna run this uh, forever. Okay, some loop here. Well, or either until, the, until we find the solution or until the open list is empty. So then we're gonna take the best n from open, whatever that is, whatever measure of, of, of best is, as I said, it's gonna be f cost, we'll talk about that. And we're gonna look at quite a few variants of this. And um, now I need to check if I found the goal. So if n is equal to the goal, then what I'm going to do is um, return the path. And um, generally what I can do is, is I can get the path um, from the data structures that I have, but um, we're not, again, we won't talk too much about those details, but generally you keep uh, some sort of uh, pointer or something else that tells you where the parents are in your data structures that allow you to extract out uh, from the goal, for instance, then you can start going backwards or from n. Um, we, we take n and we look at its parents and then whatever parent n has, we just recursively do that until we get back to the start and that's gonna give us a complete path. OK, 
Okay, so if I don't have the goal, then I'm going to continue the search. And now what I'm going to do is um, for each S in the um, successors of N, so I'm going to go for each child. And what I'm just going to really want to do here is um, generate the children. And I'm going to use a procedure here. I'm just going to call it update S. And so update is saying, um, it's, it's going to do this update procedure of expanding the node, checking if I've expanded already or something else. And if I ever get to the bottom here, then I'm going to return that there's no path. However, I want to represent that in my program. OK, so that's going to get us to a, um, a basic implementation of a best first search. And now we want to think about what is the update procedure. Okay, and the update is just a simple check here. So if I've update some node n, um, or in this case, I guess we um, we've used s on the other side, so we use s to be consistent. So this is update of some state. So if s is on the closed, then right now we're not going to think about re-expansions. Then we're just going to return and we're not going to do anything. If um, S is on open, then we want to check to see if we found a shorter path. So if um, the cost of the path to S um, that's coming from the search um, is less than the cost in open, then we're going to update the cost and the parent in the open list. Okay. And um, if it's not in the open, then the last condition we're going to have here is just to add S to open. Okay. So this is a fairly straightforward piece here, but we're just looking at our different data structures, see if we found a shorter path to it or not. And if it is, we update the path and the parent. Otherwise, we're going to add S to the open list. So this is fairly straightforward. And you know, expect that many people have seen something like this procedure before. But as I said, we're going to return to it several times in the class as we look at different algorithms. And so now from this, we can get Dijkstra's algorithm. We can get a number of different algorithms, but Dijkstra's algorithm, also called um, uniform cost search, That is because we're looking at the, um, we're, we're expanding states in order of cost. So we do the uniform cost uh, and increasing cost. And uh, so what we're going to do now is just something very simple, where uh, if we think about um, depth first search, so just to put all of this, we want to get to Dijkstra's algorithm, but just as an aside here, what is depth first search? Depth first search is a best first search where um, f of n, that is the cost of the node, is equal to the depth. And then larger is better. So in a depth first search, we basically take the state that has the largest depth and we expand that next. And that will give us the depth first search behavior. The breadth first search, and unfortunately, breadth first search and best first search both are BFS. But breadth first search is um, f of n where um, f of n is depth, but now we're just going to say smaller is better. Okay, so we've just gotten our two algorithms we looked at previously out of that. So when we look at Dijkstra's algorithm, what we're going to say here is that f of n is equal to g of n. Okay, now we haven't defined g of n, but uh, g of n is the, uh, and we have to be careful here. So we uh, oftentimes this is a detail, and I'm sure I'll do this later on in, in these lectures, but G is the, um, is the cost of the path to a node. And notice that when we have a node, this is the current cost of that path. And we're going to talk about some properties that we can prove about the G cost. And so later on, sometimes we talk about G cost in terms of the properties that we have, for instance, in Dijkstra's algorithm, A star, but 
um, it's important that we keep clear that it's just the cost of the pass so far to a node. The node could be open, it could be enclosed, or not could be generated, in which case we sort of think of it as being infinite. Okay, the other thing here, just to note, is that I'm writing these algorithms in a AI search style. If you look at these at a more graph algorithm, oftentimes they just put every node in the open list immediately with a cost of infinity. But if my state space is very large or even infinite, then that would be something I wouldn't be able to do. And now what we want to do is we want to ask a question about what is the performance of Dijkstra's algorithm. So the question is, is it going to be complete? Is it going to be optimal? And we want to think, so the solution quality, of course, if it's optimal, uh, we'll look at that. And then we want to know what is the time and what is the space. And for simplicity, we're going to assume that we're in an exponential growing state space. But we'll talk more that Dijkstra's algorithm maybe isn't often run, particularly in exponentially growing state spaces. And uh, we'll look at that. So we're just, for the simplicity of the analysis here, we'll assume that and and we're going to use d as sort of the cost of the solution there's some again some ways you might want to be a little bit more precise there this doesn't matter so much um so it ends up the dijkstra's algorithm is complete but there are some caveats here and here we either need to have a finite graph or it is actually complete with an infinite graph but a um but we need a minimum edge cost minimum positive edge cost. Okay, epsilon greater than zero. So there's got to be some constant epsilon, which is greater than zero. If we have that constant, then we can guarantee that Dijkstra's algorithm is going to always find a solution if one exists. And actually, this should be fairly, uh, or may or may not be clear. But what can happen is if I had an infinite graph, you could, but I could have arbitrary costs. You could imagine that there would be a path where the costs are one and then a half and then a fourth and then an eighth and a sixteenth and a thirty-second and a sixty-fourth. And that path could be infinitely long. And the sum of costs on that path would get you know infinitely close, but would never actually reach a cost of two. So if the optimal path was actually cost two, then I would never actually find it and the algorithm would not be complete. So we do need some minimum edge cost if we allow the graph to be infinite infinite. But if the graph is finite, then eventually we would just expand every state, and therefore we would uh, we'd have the algorithm as being complete. Um, thinking about the optimality, and it ends up that it's optimal, but we're going to do a little bit of work to prove that, and we're going to actually be very careful about that proof because this we this type of proof is very common, and so we need to understand how these proofs are built. Now there, again, we have a star here, which is going to say non-negative edge costs. And if we're thinking about non-negative edge costs, so it ends up that Dijkstra's algorithm actually, if you like go into a computing science course, they might often say, oh, and if you have negative edge costs, you can't use Dijkstra's algorithm anymore. In practice, actually, you can, but um, there's, some, there's some side impacts if you do that. Dijkstra's algorithm could have very bad performance in the worst case. And so we'll actually see that because it's going to come up again in searches. So we're not going to look at that today, but we'll come back to that later in the class, which I've been saying a lot. But um, we'll also show that the time complexity is O of B to the D, and the space complexity is O of B to the D. Again, there's some caveats here, and I'm using big O notation, um, but we're, we're not going to worry about being more precise than that. So we want to build a proof now. What we're going to pay attention to is the proof of the optimality of Dijkstra's algorithm. And in order to be, build this proof, we need a picture here. So I'm going to draw a high-level picture. And this high-level picture is going to sort of show us what's going on in the state space. Okay. And so the idea here is that we're going to have um, some high-level picture of all the nodes in the state space. So I'm going to just color these in here. And this is all nodes in the state space. So this is all nodes. And then within the set of all nodes in the state space, we're going to have a set here of nodes that are closed. 
And actually, in my animations, the nodes that are closed are in red. So um, just for the sake of uh, consistency with the animations that are sitting on my web page, I'll go ahead and make the, these other nodes be uh, more yellow-like so we have consistent coloring there. OK, so we're going to have a set of nodes here that are closed. And then we're also going to have another set of nodes. And these are the set, set of nodes that are open. And it ends up that actually the closed nodes form a border in the middle, and then there's a layer of open nodes, and then there's a layer of the rest of the nodes. And uh, again, to be consistent with how my demos run, I'm going to make these nodes that are open, and I'm going to color them in green. So when you see any of the demos, and even the things that were shown in the uh, earlier lectures, so make that a little bit darker red there, uh, we have closed nodes in red, open nodes in green. These other nodes we won't actually draw. Um, or we'll draw them sort of with nothing in the state space. And the idea here is that we're going to have a path. So if you think about a path from the start state, it's going to start from the start, and it's going to go through some number of closed nodes. And then it's going to go on to a node that's on open. It might actually go through multiple nodes on open. It is possible. And then it's going to continue out through nodes that have yet to be generated. And eventually the path is going to reach the goal. Okay. And uh, we have the start sitting up here. So this is the picture of what we have. And, um, and we're going to use this picture to try and come up with some of the proofs of what happens when we run a best first search. Okay. So in order to do this, we're going to need a, a number of different properties. And so let's start to look at some of the properties we have and, and think about how we can prove these. So we're going to property number one. Property number one is that as we uh, expand any path, and so this is thinking, you know, when I generate a state, if uh, you know, when I generate it, then the parent is the one that generated it. If the state had been generated before, then the shortest path goes to the parent. And so um, I'm not going to get into that detail or you know, be any more precise along thinking about paths or where the paths come from. But uh, property number one is going to say g costs along any path. Are monotonically increasing. Okay, and here we're using the version where we have some epsilon edge costs. Epsilon greater than zero. Okay, and so the idea here would be property one, we'll, we'll want to show this the g costs along any path are monotonically increasing. Um, this is going to say that as I add nodes to a path, then that increases the cost of that path. Okay. And um, and this is and this is obvious, right? So or maybe not obvious, but it shouldn't be too hard, right? I generate a new node, I get a positive edge cost, and then um, that that edge, and you know, if I if it's a new node and I have found a shorter, um, either if I found a shorter path from the new parent or I've never generated it before then I'm, the path cost is going to be greater than what it was of the parent. And then if it's a node that I found a, a path to, um, so I find a node, I find a path to a, a child that had already been generated with smaller cost. Well, when it was generated, it was generated with smaller cost than its parent. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. As if, if I have my edge costs all greater than zero, then along a path, the G costs are going to monotonically increase. Property number two. Property number two is going to be talking about um, a node that is um, that is going to be actually this node right here. So this is a node that is on the open list, and it is also on the optimal path. And we're going to say is that we have this property that there's always a node on the open list that is on the optimal path. And this is going to hold all the way until we reach the goal. Of course, when I pull the goal off the open list, then that property doesn't hold right at that point. But right up until that point, that's all it's going to hold. So a node on the optimal path um, to any reachable state. S is always on the open list. 
and it's not always not only not always on the uh, sorry not only always on the open lists but it's also going to have optimal g cost So we're always going to have a node, which is the next step in the optimal path, sitting on open with the optimal cost waiting to be expanded. And as I said, this holds up until we expand the goal. And so the way that this is going to hold right now is that we're going to do a proof by induction. So we're going to think about the process of generating this path. And we'll show inductively that as we generate this path, each of the nodes that are inside here, that we'll always have this one right here, which is the next state in the path that is on open. And when it's there, it'll be there with optimal cost. Okay. So how do we prove this? A proof by induction. Okay. So um, this one we uh, didn't do a full proof for. But, um, but we have this. We're done with this part this piece right here, that's property number one. Okay, property number two, we're going to um, look at this one. And we're gonna try and prove this, or we'll write our proof over here. Okay, so initially, and this is if we were to look at the pseudocode, just going back up here, if we look at the pseudocode, uh, it's really inside this while loop right here that we're gonna have this property holding. And basically, it's holding it's holding right at this point right here, and so this is you know I can take this state off when I find the goal I, I terminate here, but it's this point when I start each loop of this while loop that we're going to have this invariant holding. Okay, so initially the open, uh, the start, oops, go back to here, the start is on open, and it's going to be there with cost zero. And so, of course, this holds. Property number two holds initially. And now, um, in, by induction, what we're going to think about is, now that I know it holds initially, we're going to assume it holds after n expansions. And the question is, what happens when you do the n, uh, the n plus 1? n plus 1. Okay, so if we look at what happened here, uh, we know that there is some state, and again, we'll look at this figure right here. We know after n expansions that there is some state here on open that has optimal G cost and has yet to be expanded. Okay, and so um, what can happen in step n plus one? Well, there's two things that could happen. There might be some other state on open. There could be many other states here, and I might expand one of those states. And if I do that, um, only the state that it gets expanded is moved to closed. And so that doesn't do anything to the state, which is the one we care about here, the next state in this path. And so if that happens, well, then the property still holds and we'll be okay. Okay. The second thing that can happen is that, um, is that we could come to this state and we could choose to expand it. And if we choose to expand this state, then it's going to have a successor, which is the next step in the path. And because we've reached this optimally, then the next state is actually going to be reached optimally as well. And this state is going to be on the open list because um, the only state that goes to closed is the one that we expand. The next one, um, maybe we're going to update the cost, maybe we're not, but it's going to be on open with the optimal cost once we're done with the expansion procedure. Okay, so either we expand And um, here, the, the node we care about here, we're going to call P, if P is the next in the path. Either we expand P, and we show that we'd be OK in that case, or we uh, don't. And we showed that if we don't expand P, then we'd also be OK. And so here, it's very clear there's only two possibilities. We expand P or we don't. Both cases, we have this, still pro this property. And so we can say um, that this has been proven. Okay, so we've got property one and we've got property two. Okay, and now um, we're gonna actually uh, go a little bit further here. Given these properties, we can uh, say something a little bit stronger. And in fact, if you look at um, what might happen, the, we look at property two, it actually doesn't disallow 
that this next date here that is going to go on the next that it couldn't be on the closed list. Uh, it could have been on closed and then maybe taken back off closed again, but we're actually going to show that no, that can't happen. Okay. So property number three. And what do we want to show here? So we're going to show that every closed node has optimal G cost. Okay. And um, so if we think about this property here that we're uh, wanting to show, um, this is what th this would be saying is that when we again when we look at this state here, if this state had been on the been on the closed list, then we would have reached it optimally. And um, and this is saying no, that can't happen because if this node was closed, we would have reached it optimally already. But we know it's the next node in the path, and so we have to come along here to actually get the optimal path to it. Okay. So how are we going to prove that this is true? Well, it ends up that just like we did before, we'll be able to prove this by induction. So what are we going to think about? Well, initially, there's no states on the closed list. Um, uh, the closed is empty. Oops, right. Okay, and what happens when the closed list is empty? Well, and then the property holds, right? Every closed list has optimal G costs, so we're good. And then, um, so that's the first step. And then we're going to assume that it holds again after n expansions. So after n expansions, every node on closed, we assume has optimal G cost. And then what about n plus 1? Okay. And, um, and now we're going to expand any node next at this next step. And we'll call this node, um, as we did before, where we choose to expand P, whatever node P happens to be. OK, and so the question we're going to do now here is, um, in order to prove that P has optimal G cost, we want to do a proof by contradiction. OK, so we're in the middle of a, uh, a proof by induction, but we need a proof by contradiction to show that P so we're going to assume, we want to say that P is going to be expanded with optimal G cost, but let's assume it didn't. Okay, so let's assume P um, didn't have optimal G cost. Okay, what would happen? Okay, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and look at property one. Okay, G costs along any path are monotonically increasing. Okay, and what that means is that to P, there must be another path that um, is going to reach P. And, and so there must be some other node along that path that, um, that, that reaches P. And we also know, so if we look actually at the proof here, this is to any reachable state S. It's not actually to the goal. In this case, I drew it as to the goal, but it really could be any state, and the proof holds exactly the same. So for any reachable state, this holds. Okay, so if P didn't have optimal G cost, then there would have to be, there must be a, a node, and here we're gonna call N, um, on the optimal path to P. which is on the open list. Uh, open, and, um, and we see that from both property one, and it comes from both property one and property two. Okay, and, um, and so if we think about n, we actually know that n, g of n, has to be less than g of p. But, as an algorithm, what is Dijkstra algorithm doing? Well, it's expanding by minimum g of n. Okay, and so if there was an n that had lower g uh, cost than p, then we would expand g first, but we didn't, and therefore it's impossible for n to actually exist. So there's a contradiction. Um, if p didn't have optimal g cost, then there would be some n that would get us there with a shorter path or shorter cost. 
and um, but if it did, that node would have a lower G cost, and we know that that node um, has to be on the would have to be on the open list, and therefore it would be expanded beforehand. So as a result, we can then say that this property holds. Okay. Now uh, there's a corollary to this, which is that every node is expanded is the, at least at most once. Oops, sorry. Property 3a is that every node is expanded at most once. Okay, and this follows because, well, once I put a closed node on the closed, it has the optimal G cost. Once it's, once it's on the a closed list, then I can never find a shorter path to it, so I could never expand it again. Okay, so that's a useful property, and we'll use that. And so now uh, we're going to get to property number four, which is every node with a finite path cost. And this is a finite path cost. The finite path cost to that node will eventually be expanded. Now there is an assumption here that we've made uh, previously in the class. And that's that we've assumed that the branching factor is constant. Um, in fact, the branching factor can be large, but it has to have some bound on it. If the branching factor were to get very, very large, uh, we could imagine that, or basically infinite, that we would never reach some other states. So we're going to sort of rule that out. Um, an infinite branching factor. Okay, and so um, now we want to think about, we're, we're going to just reason directly about this. So the question is, are, could we ever have an infinite number of states with cost less than any particular node in the world that has some finite cost? Okay. And so here, we know that the branching factor is constant. And so we think about in the tree, uh, the number of nodes, so we're going to, the, the proof here is just going to be a number of observations. So there's an, an, uh, the number of nodes uh, is bounded, and this is at a depth. Now I have to be careful here. This is depth, not G cost, uh, but the number of nodes is bounded by N of B comma D, which is what we looked at when we were looking at um, we we're looking at depth versus iter deepening and looking at breadth versus search as well. Okay, so that says it's bounded, and it really you could have a general function here if you had other types of state spaces. And so the point here is it's bounded by some function, and it's bounded to be finite. Okay, so there's a finite number of nodes um, as we go. And we also know that um, each expansion increases the cost. Okay, that's coming from property one. The G costs are monotonically increasing. And um, okay, so this is going to tell us now that there's, okay, we're, we've got these expansions, we're going to increase the cost. The number of nodes is bounded, so we would think that we're going to start making progress there. But we do need uh, property 3a, which is um, because no, expand, no state is expanded twice. And that's important because uh, that's, so that's coming from 3a. So I didn't, um, there's a corollary there. And what that means is that there's a finite number of states, and I can't re-expand them an infinite number of times. Actually, I'm going to expand each of them once. And what that means is that um, now thinking about this, the number of nodes at each any depth, and this is depth in terms of uh, at number of edges, um, is bounded. But that means that after a finite uh, number of expansions, that the um, path cost increases. Okay, so there could be a finite number of states which all have the same path cost, but after that there's going to be some finite number, because we know there's a bound on the number of nodes, um, after which the path cost has to increase. And therefore, if you follow this, it follows from this that basically, well, that means the path cost keeps increasing. Eventually, any finite cost will be reached. It may take a really long time, but eventually we'll reach there. Okay, and so that is going to tell us then that um, that from here we can infer that Dijkstra's algorithm is actually going to reach any cost, and um, because every node is expanded, um, 
every node goes onto the closed list or when it's expanded, it's expanded with the optimal G cost, which is the property we need here, um, or when it's expanded. So that's, we would only put nodes on the closed list when we pull them off to expand them. So we know when I choose the goal that um, then we're gonna have found it with an optimal path. Now we could then try and reason what, some, what are some things that could happen? Um, well, could we run out of nodes on the open list? And the answer is no, we couldn't do that. Property number two guarantees this because there's always a node on the optimal path um, on open. So we couldn't run out of nodes on open without reaching the goal. Could we expand states forever and never reach the goal? No, because every node with finite cost will eventually be expanded. And so we're guaranteed to expand the goal. And in fact, we're guaranteed to do it in a finite number of steps and we're guaranteed to do it with optimal cost. Okay, so um, a lot of details here, and um, you know we've we've gone into quite a bit in this proof, but hopefully this gives us a, a very much, a much deeper sense than uh, maybe you would get, for instance, in an undergraduate class that would look at something like Dijkstra's algorithm A star of why we really can in in some detail show why this algorithm is going to be optimal and complete. And so going back up to the properties that we had here. We can then say, is it complete? Yes, we've shown that it's complete. Um, if the graph is finite, then the arguments are actually a little bit easier to make, but we made it just assuming some minimum edge cost. Um, we showed that it's optimal as long as we have non-negative edge cost. So we have some minimum edge cost, then that's fine, right? So that's this actually disallows the non-negative edge cost. Um, and um, then we have the time and space complexity. So what happens? Well, in the worst case, we'd expand every node in the entire graph or every node with cost up to the solution cost. And so here we might, instead of D, so I told you before I wasn't quite being precise, here instead of D, we may wanna say like B to the C star. Uh, and that has to do with, you know, what is my edge cost here and the minimum edge cost. Or, you know, we might think, if we're thinking about nodes, then we might wanna say something like um, B to the D divided by epsilon, whatever the minimum edge cost is. Okay. But those details, uh, you know, are, are not sort of, um, they're not, they don't really matter when it comes to the proof of the correctness and why these things are working. Okay, so this is um, Dijkstra's algorithm. And so what we've had in this lecture is we've seen best first search and we've seen our first example. We've actually seen our first three examples, the Dijkstra's algorithm and breadth first search. So Dijkstra's and, um, sorry, Dijkstra's depth first search and breadth first search can all be expressed as a best first search algorithm. And we've shown that Dijkstra's algorithm is optimal and complete. And so that's great under certain properties. And what we're going to start looking at after this now is we're going to start to get into heuristic estimates. What can I do? What is now the information I can use? As I said, this is where we're starting to get into sort of the AI, which is what sort of intelligence can I add? What knowledge might we learn that is going to allow us to search and search more efficiently.